Stanford University. Good afternoon. Welcome to Double E 380. As I mentioned last week, we're ending the quarter with a couple of somewhat theoretical talks, next week's talk being on game theory. Today's talk is on one of the oldest areas of theoretical computer science, namely grammars and parsing. Past work has emphasized expressiveness and efficiency, while practical work has concentrated on tools, error handling, and the like. That leaves an interesting gap, minimality, which is, hasn't been as widely addressed in grammars and parsing as it is in other areas, considering we always are trying for small in computer science. Um, that is addressed by today's speaker, Bill McKeeman of Dartmouth and MathWorks. Thank you, sir. Uh, nice to be back in this audience. It's been quite a while. Um, there's a little prologue that I want to enunciate to you. This is not something which is new. It actually started more than 40 years ago. And it started in a funny situation where as a professor at Santa Cruz, a somewhat scruffy looking student wandered into my office looking for a senior thesis topic. And you know, I'm never very serious about these things, senior thesis being what it is. And so I said to this student, well, why don't you write the smallest extendable self-compiling compiler? I, thought I was doing XPL at the time. We were doing self-compiling compilers. It seemed like a good thing to do. And so the student went off, and he came in, handed his thesis in on one whole earth card. Okay, 27 characters. Uh, and that was actually just the front end. The back end took 63 characters. So, well, I, needless to say, he got my attention, and that eventually led to what you're going to see today. I've played with it over the years, mostly used it to present in classes, uh, because it's kind of fun and there's certain symmetries to it that make it fun to play with as opposed to necessarily practical and surely not deep, but nevertheless. That student happens to be with us, it's Doug Michaels, uh, who after uh, he left Santa Cruz hired me uh, to work for the Santa Cruz operation and went on to all sorts of other fame. You probably know Doug much better than I do, actually. So anyway, this all starts back with a senior thesis in, uh, in uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, unfortunately, this screen is not showing something which is much more apparent uh, when you look at it. Thing. This line here is actually got a gray background on it. And in fact, that means it's executable code that is, MATLAB, the product I work on, can execute that line. And this whole uh, talk is something that's generated by having one MATLAB program and running it. And there's a f feature called Publish, which turns all the interleaved comments and output into a single stream of text so that you can present it on the web. It's called MATLAB Publishing. It's been in the product for several years. And it's, it's a little unfortunate that you can't see the gray because the gray is the executable code and it got executed and its output gets inserted right after that code. Now this format statement, which gets rid of the double spacing, doesn't have any output. So you don't see any output here, but you will see output as this talk proceeds as every time one of these ex executable lines shows up, then the output will show up immediately beneath it. Now it turns out that the MATLAB publish feature just makes one great big HTML file, but it's so simply formatted that I wrote a post processor for the HTML file in MATLAB that turns it into slides. So these slides are post processing of the HTML production of a script running in MATLAB. So there's several levels of indirection in there. Uh, one other thing, I work for MathWorks, I'm a programmer, uh, and I make no apology about the fact that I fall in love with MATLAB. Uh, I do everything in MATLAB now. I do my C++, I do my airline, I do my Python, I do my HTML, I do everything in MATLAB. It is my platform. It runs on Macs, it runs on Windows, it runs on Unix. Consistent platform, get everything done I want to get done. So it is my programming platform. And I've stopped being a Emacs bigot and a Unix bigot, and I've turned into a MATLAB bigot. So bear with me if I seem to like some of this stuff better than you might, but 
Think about it, MATLAB has changed over the years, and some of you probably know an old MATLAB that you think is pretty awful. Try the new MATLAB. It's coming along and will get better in the next couple of years. Now, unfortunately, I have to get down here and run this mouse to uh, run through my own previous next stuff. What I want to talk about uh, is self-compiling compilers, or actually executable grammars, which just turns out that's the solution that uh, Doug came up with. And the idea is that you take a grammar and add a little bit of capability to it. These are very small things, and you see if you can turn them in themselves and grow them and grow them and grow them and grow them, and we're headed to GCC. Okay, the upper end of this thing is a compiler like GCC or Java C, one of those guys. Uh, so that's where we're going. So I have to introduce a few things. This is the outline of the entire talk. Uh, input output grammar, that's a small extension which I will show you the definition of in a minute. Uh, there's certain primitives, that is basically the RGB of my TV set here, the very few things that I can do with it. Everything has to be composed of those primitives. Then I'll give you a little peek at how GEM works, but when you're talking about a program, it's really hard to talk about the program itself. I'll give you a peek at it so you can see the general nature of it, but most of the time I'm going to show you what it does and run it for you, so you'll see its cause and effect as opposed to the actual code. The code, however, is available as is his entire talk, as is the entire compiler course in which is embedded on the MATLAB file exchange. Anybody can download it. At the last time I looked, it was 15 megs compressed, about 19 megs uncompressed. So there's a lot of stuff there, and this is buried down somewhere in the middle of it. I didn't put it on the web for this seminar so you could do it, because I'm changing it every day. And when I get back, I'm going to change it one more time. So the best version of this talk, which you're going to see here today, won't show up at MathWorks until probably next Tuesday or Wednesday, and when I actually get back into the office. I can do it from here, but it's a pain, and there's no real reason. You're going to get it here. Okay, so then there's certain capabilities that come with this notation, with this minimal thing, and I'll show you these basic capabilities, and then I'll start the process of extending them as we work our way towards GCC step by step. Uh, I'll get tired of that. You'll get tired of that. These things are hard to look at, actually, uh, at some point. So then I'm going to stop doing the extension, having, I believe, left you with the feeling that you could go a lot farther there if you just wanted to. And I'm going to step back to efficiency and convenience. I'm going to do a different version of GEM, which runs 100 times faster, has a lot more reliability, is a lot easier to use. So it's a second version of this that I'm going to be using. And then I'll actually demonstrate it being used as a compiler uh, and actually executing the code that it compiles, uh, all from uh, within MATLAB. And I'll say a word or two about debugging. This is a backtracking compiler, and backtracking compilers are notoriously ugly when you're trying to debug them. Because when they find a problem, they back out, and they back out. And when they finally get back out to the beginning and throw everything away, they say, oh, there was a problem in there somewhere. Okay, so it's a little bit of a difficulty to get the diagnostics uh, so that you like them. Although I've made some progress on that, and I will show you that also. So here we are. This is the only place I think you'll see any uh, Greek letters. Um, this is LaTeX. Uh, embedded inside of MATLAB. These, this published thing has an ability to stick in LaTeX, stick in HTML, stick in anything you want. And in fact, in the standard kind of notation, my new grammars up here are just like the old context-free grammars, that they have one more vocabulary. They have not just a terminal vocabulary, which you're used to in context-free grammars, but they have an input vocabulary and an output vocabulary. And they stand in the same place uh, in that. They also have a phrase name vocabulary, and they have a set of goal symbols. Well, you could have just one goal symbol, and for this talk, that would have done. But for many things I do in my course, and particularly the finite state machines, multiple goal symbols turns out to be a more convenient uh, representation. And finally, a set of rules pi. Uh, these are the things that can actually uh, are all the grammar rules, the context-free grammar rules. And there are a few conditions on these things, which is typical if you're used to the context-free grammars. The vocabularies have to be disjoint, and V itself is all the vocabularies munched uh, together. The goal symbols have to be uh, phrase names, a subset of the phrase names, and the rules are a subset of the names cross the sequences of things from the vocabulary. This is all standard stuff. Find that in any textbook, except I've slipped in one of the vocabulary uh, here. 
And if you v o, that is the output vocabulary, is empty, this is just a context-free grammar. So nothing really new here. However, when I get it into the machine, representing it in ASCII, uh, then I have some restrictions. White space can't be allowed between symbols because my grammar machine doesn't know what to do with white space. And the uh, input, output, and phrase name symbols are all single character. Uh, that's sort of a nuisance, and we'll have to take care of that. And the IOG must not be left recursive because as any recursive compiler, you make it left recursive, stack overflow instantly. So these are the initial restrictions. However, I tell you that all those, well, all but one of those will go away by the end of the talk. That is, these grammars are able to help themselves, bootstrap style, to uh, solve those particular inconveniences. So the way to look at it, GEM, Grammar Executing Machine, uh, got me in trouble when I was at digital. GEM there was their optimizer. So they fought with me for the name. Uh, for a while, I kept it quiet. When I went to MathWorks, they don't have a gem, so I'm able to do that. Anyway, it looks like a function. It takes an input text, I, uh, an input grammar, which is basically the code, and it makes an output text. So it's a function with one output and two inputs, one of which is to be thought of as text to be compiled, and the other which is to be the compiler itself. So it's like a stored program computer, and G is the stored program. And I can make it available for the talk by running some MATLAB. Now, as I told you, that if you can't see the gray bar, it's there. I'm actually running some code there. G is get assigned to GEM. GEM is a function, which I've implemented in MATLAB. And so I've got that now held in a thing. It's like a class. Think of it as a class or an object. And I go into that object, and I grab the run method out of it and put it into a variable named capital GEM. So this now has given me the ability to run it by just saying capital GEM and giving it the two arguments. So all I've done is gone into my uh, object and grabbed out the one thing I really want, which is the ability to run it. There's more in there, but this is just MATLAB. And it seems, for those of you who have known MATLAB in the past, a little unusual to have functions as first class values. But they are. I can assign them uh, like anything else. If you want to run them, you have to give them parentheses. So here's a couple of little examples uh, just to show you how the thing works. Uh, up at the top, I have a print statement. And I call gem as the expression that's going to get printed. Well, the input argument is the null string, quote, quote. So I'm feeding it nothing. The grammar has only got one rule, and it says r equals nothing. So it's the grammar that recognizes the null string and only the null string will reject anything else. And I fed the null string to it. So when I run it, it doesn't do any output. And so it says the result is null. So this is an example. It turns out that a very large amount of stuff happened between the f printf and the printout res equals the empty string. A lot happened there. But you don't see it because nothing went wrong. If I had fed it something that wasn't the null string, or I'd fed it a grammar that didn't like the null string, then you'd have seen a big error blossom show up on the screen. But I don't want to scare you with error blossoms right now. So for the moment, I'm only going to give it things that it can actually do. And in this case, this grammar, r equals empty, recognized the empty string, and gave it an empty output. So here's another one. Uh, I have an assignment here to G1, which in MATLAB has got some double quotes. So I print it out as a string, and sure enough, the grammar is one rule, and it says, quote, x, quote, that means input x, double quote, y, double quote, output y. So this grammar insists that the input be exactly x, and it tells you that the output, if it is, the output will be exactly y. So one input symbol and one output symbol. And so I run that guy. I call gem, and I feed it the text x, which is allowed, and I feed it the grammar 1, which is up there, and it says result equals y. OK? Can you all see that? I can make the text bigger if you like. No complaints. All right. So anyway, there we go. Uh, the, the, this is basically the whole palette. Uh, one more thing that grammars can do. Uh, you can have a grammar, as we see here uh, printed out, where R is S. And S can either be a 1 or a 2. So this is a grammar that recognizes the language 1 or 2. OK? And if I feed it 1 here and run gem on it, it says the result is 
empty because there was no output. Okay? This is it. There is no more. There's input, output, multiple rules, empty strings. And that's now the palette that I have to paint with to do the rest of the talk. So, good, well, that's not very complicated, and those are all pretty simple things. Let's see where we can go with that. Turns out that uh, the implementation of this thing is, I'm going to screen this up to where you can actually see a piece of it. The implementation of this is in C. It's in what's called a MEX file in MATLAB. Uh, and this is all pointer arithmetic here. In particular, when it's parsing, up there, case parse, and alpha says it's seen a letter, it has one, two, three, four, five cycles. It's about five nanoseconds to do a recursive call. Okay? So this thing is just absolutely blitz fast when compiled by GCC with all the optimization turned on. Even though it's doing a lot of stuff, it's not very efficient in terms of computational complexity, it is so fast that you just can't see it do anything. It does everything in zero time from your perception viewpoint. Anyway, I don't want to show you much of this C++ code. The nice thing is that it works. And you'll see it working here. And what's working is just this code. That's the entire executing mechanism. There's some stuff at the bottom that sets it up, and there's some stuff at the top. And there's some setup at the top, and there's some cleanup at the bottom. But during the execution, this is it. So it's a very simple little piece of uh, code walking forth. Now that's the parse. And it turns out that every time you find a symbol that you want to compile, recall recursively, you have to search the grammar for it. So there's a second mode of operation in this little guy here, which is at the bottom. Search. And this is searching through the grammar, looking for a match for the name you have seen in the input, and you actually want to uh, compile. So it searches until it finds it. When it finally does find it, then it says, OK, ready to go back and start parsing again. And it stays in this same loop, but goes back to the top and begins parsing. It now has found a definition for that. When it fails to make a match, sometimes you say you must input an X. And there isn't an X there in the input. It has to backtrack. And so what it does, uh, that only shows up here uh, when you uh, get a failure on the input. And it will, in fact, go and start uh, backtracking, uh, which shows up here. Uh, it runs into the equal. It knows it's done. And it starts backtracking. Backtracking works by actually executing the code backwards. That is, say, you've been going forward character at a time. When it takes the backtrack, it just unsows it going character at a time backwards and completely undoes the code. So there's no state saving going on here in the backtracking. The code is symmetrical for execute and backtrack. And the backtracker doesn't have to do anything because it's just trying to get back. So it's a slightly simpler piece of code than the forward thing, which actually has to make some decisions. Backtracking just has to get back. So the code, absolutely symmetrical, right to left and left to right. It's the assembly language that runs backwards, which was sort of a Valhalla in the days when I was doing compiler writing. So that's a little bit. You see I've printed out lines 113 to 190 of about 200 uh, of this thing. And you can see the whole thing by downloading the gadget uh, off the web. Well, here's what I've just said. Uh, the grammar is going to be executed right to left and left to right. And going backwards, they exactly undo what was done going forward. And there's only three things that can happen. If it runs into a letter, that's a recursive call. Uh, if you uh, see an input that you match, you do a shift. Uh, you can move a character to the output with double quotes. Or you may come to the end of a grammar rule, which is a semicolon, and that's a reduce. So it's a shift-reduce compiler run recursively. And all it's doing is these things. And whenever it runs into trouble and doesn't get a match, then it backs out and tries again. And it does, it does a lot of backtracking. It's not, uh, it's not shy about backtracking. It backtracks a lot. So this is now, if it finally gets down to where all the input's been used up and the stack the recursion stack is empty, it knows it succeeded. It says, OK, wow, I applied all these rules. I ate up all the input text, and I've recognized whatever your goal symbol was. And therefore, I can tell you what the output is. And you only get output if it finally gets down to that stage of empty stack, used up input. Well, it turns out, to actually show you any of these things, 
There are some things which are so tedious that you really, in an audience, don't want to see them. Uh, digits, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, and ASCII, these are character classes which you very often want to use when you're doing language processing. And so I have predefined some classes. This is the one for digit. This says if you see a zero, emit a zero. If you see a one, emit a one. That's simply passing digits along. So that's one of the eight predefined grammars. And I use uppercase D uh, to signify that. Uh, anyway, it's just a grammar. It's in there. And any time you want to use it, you can concatenate it to the grammar that you've written. So your grammar gets longer by these built-in grammars. Uh, otherwise, nothing has changed except that you don't have to look at these things. The ASCII grammar, as you'll see in just a minute, eh, it's a little long. It's not something you want to watch on a screen. But here's an example of using them. Uh, here I've said, OK, uh, take the grammar R equals D. That's the whole grammar. Concatenate onto it digit IOG. That's the one up above. That gives me a longer grammar. And then run that grammar against a 7. Well, this says that R should be any kind of digit. If I find that digit is 7, it says, OK, emit a 7. So it will emit any digit that it sees. And I run it on 7, and sure enough, it says the answer is 7. So it actually did that. And as I say, behind the covers, hey, there's a lot going on uh, down in there. Uh, so here's the first real grammar. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading these things to you, because I'll put you all to sleep. Uh, and at that would be a mistake, I think. In any case, here's the first grammar of any substance in it. Since the executing machine cannot take blanks, I need a way to take the blanks out. And so here is my deblanker. I call it no white. And let me describe, just so you get the idea of how these grammars work, this one in a little bit of detail. So it says here a G is a P followed by a G. Well, that says a G, a P, a P, a P, a P. It's a sequence of P's. And it can be empty, because so your G can be nothing. So this is a sequence of P's. Uh, and what are the P's? Well, the first possibility for P is a blank. Any output? No. So if it sees a blank, it just throws it away and goes back. P is done, goes back up here and looks for another P. The next possibility for P is a new line. And there's no output for that either, so it throws the new line away. OK, then it, if it's neither of these, it says, OK, well, let's try one of these. It's an I followed by an A followed by an I. Well, I is defined down here. It says, if you see a single quote, emit a single quote. So that passes single quotes along. So it says, this is a single quote. You saw it, you emit it. A says anything. You see anything, pass it along, any ASCII character. And then you better see a matching single quote, and you emit the single quote. So this says, pass single quote, any character single quote, along untouched in the output, including blanks. Whatever A likes here can get passed along. This is the same thing for output. It says if you see a double quote, then emit the double quote. Any character whatsoever is acceptable in the output. You see another double quote, you better emit the double quote to match it up. Okay, that takes care of all the things that have to be protected. Then it says if you see anything else, just pass it along. Okay, that's the end of the grammar, except that I've used A here. So uh, if I'm going to use A, then I have to attach, catenate ASCII IOG which is all of ASCII to it, so that it can, in fact, find out how all those A's are. So that's a deblanker. Uh, and it's convenient, because I don't have to write these compilers, these, like, these grammars on deblank. And here it is. I've said now, take G. That's the thing, that I, that class that I printed out up earlier. Look at the no white element of it. And here it is. And notice that all the white space has been squeezed out of it, except between quotes. Now, it's not much fun to look at because it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes because there's a lot of ASCII, okay? So usually when I present these things, I won't print out these big long things. I will print it as I did down here. I will search for the first character of the ASCII and then only print from the beginning to that point. And then I will print ASCII IOG uh, right after it. So in this case, when I do all that printing, I get the same grammar up to the place where it started doing the ASCII. That just reminds you that there is another big long grammar tacked on there. That's a convenience. It's a, a kindness of me to you that you don't have to look at that big long set of things going off the screen. They aren't much fun to look at. And you only see them once more in this whole talk. Uh, I tried to get rid of that, but I couldn't. 
Okay, well, here's MATLAB making me love it. Uh, I now have the ability to deblank a string, so I define a MATLAB anonymous function for ampersand read lambda. It's a function with a single parameter, and it's going to have an expression on the right-hand side, which is g.run. It's going to run this thing. I feed the text to it, and I feed no white as the grammar. So this now will take any input text and squeeze all the blanks out of it and the new lines. And that's a MATLAB function uh, that's doing that. So I'm leaning on MATLAB to help the presentation. It's not doing anything I couldn't do by uh, running it by hand. And Jim, I've changed the definition. I'm now making Jim scan the grammar. It always has to be deblanked anyway. So sometimes it's wasted. It deblanks something's already deblanked. But this guarantees me now the gem will not fail because I forget to take the blanks out, out of the grammar. So I've just defined two functions here that will be convenient uh, during the rest of the, of the presentation. And in fact, to test it, I call scan on this character string here with some blanks in it, and it says the answer doesn't have any blanks in it anymore. So I made my first step. I allow myself the freedom to write grammars that please my eye. Nevertheless, I can squeeze the blanks out and make them please Jim. So the two of us have agreed on this being a good thing. Of course, it's a pain in the neck. Once you get the blanks squeezed out, uh, they're really ugly to look at. So the next trick is the antidote to the no white grammar. I want to put the blanks back in so that I can make them readable. That makes I can write them any way I want. And this pretty printer here will put them out. And it's an example of its own output. So I want to take just a minute to convince you that this thing is uh, what it says. It sets up here, a G is an R followed by a G, and a G is an empty. Okay, that's a sequence of R's. What are R's rules? The first rule here is self-descriptive. Now, let me convince you of that. It has a phrase name on the left, it must, and then an equal, and then it has a formula which describes the innards of it. Well, what's the formula? The formula says, well, take any letter, upper or lower case, and you better find an equal. If you do, okay, that's a grammar rule. Started with a letter, it's got an equal. Emit a blank. So I put the blank between the name and the thing. So that's this blank over here that got emitted by the pretty printer. So then put out the equal. So there's the equal coming out. And now, well, there's the rest of the formula. So we have to go down and look at that. And eventually, you're going to see a semicolon. All these rules terminate in a semicolon. If you do see one, you emit a semicolon. And then you emit a carriage return, uh, and then the semicolon terminating the rule. So that rule absolutely describes itself, except that we haven't looked at what a formula is. But the formula isn't much different than you saw in the deblanker. It just keeps the stuff that has to keep and throws everything else away. Now, it turns out that where in the last one I said P equals A here, anything was allowed in the deblanker. In grammars, only letters are allowed. That's all you can put in there, because a grammar he either has input symbols, output symbols, or phrase names, and that's all it can have. So it's a little more restricted than the deblanker here in only allowing, on the right-hand side, these three possible things. Okay, well, this guy now can be run. It also turns out to be a syntax checker. If any grammar gets by this and gets pretty printed without causing an error, it was syntactically correct according to my uh, grammar. So, okay, well, I'll show you the pretty printer running later. Here's the final basic trick. The language has input symbols and it has output symbols. And except for the quote marks, they're exactly the same. So if you change the single quotes for double quotes and the double quotes for single quotes, you turn a compiler into decompiler. That is to say, it's going to look for its output and make its input. Okay? All you have to do is switch the inputs and the outputs, quotes, and this is a little grammar that does that. So let's take a brief look at it. Uh, I don't use the capital I here. It says here, if I see a single quote, emit a double quote. Then take any character whatsoever. Now, if I see a single quote, emit a double quote. So let's turn quote A quote into double quote A quote, whatever the A is. So this thing, this little tiny grammar here, and of course has to use the ASCII uh, IOG because any character goes in the A. This grammar now will turn any grammar into any compiler into decompiler, except not all of them are invertible. Ambiguous grammars are not invertible because you don't know what the answer ought to be. So it will fail sometimes, but it doesn't fail all the time. So here's an example of it actually working. Uh, up there is a grammar for 
right associative expressions. These are very convenient in a right recursive language. And so what I do for these things, if I see a plus, uh, then I emit rule one. If I see a minus, I emit rule two. What I'm really going to make is my output code is the canonical parse. It will tell me the rule numbers that were applied to parse the input. And in fact, to be very specific for those who don't teach compiler writing every day, if I start with a string, hello, give me my chord. Uh, if I start with a string x plus x minus x, which this grammar describes, the first thing I do is rewrite the leftmost x to a t that took rule four. Then I write this x to a t, and that takes rule four. Then I rewrite this x to a t, that takes rule four. And then finally, this t gets rewritten to an e, that takes rule three. This t minus e gets rewritten to an e, that takes rule two. And finally, t plus e gets written to e, that takes rule one. e gets rewritten to g, does rule zero, and it quits. Okay, that's, you know, compiler writing day one, but I didn't want to have a bunch of these numbers show up on the screen without having taken the trouble to explain them. If you run it, it says, oh yes, uh, the sequence of rules that were applied, the output of taking sum and running it on this particular uh, thing, notice that this got deblanked because gem deblanks now. So running on this particular string gave me this 443210, which is what I predicted it should get up here. Now I do the real trick. I say, okay, take the sum as input, that grammar, scan it, squeeze all the blanks out of it, feed it to the inverter, change the single quotes to double quotes, and now it's a new grammar called inverted sum. Store it in a MATLAB variable. And now I can run inverted sum as the grammar. Sorry. Yeah, inverted sum as the input, and I call it on, and I didn't really have to call scan here, actually. Uh, yes, I did, because I'm not calling gem. Scan g.pretty, and this pretty prints the inverted sum. Well, it hasn't got quite as much taste as I do. I would have lined these things up, but it didn't. Put one space in. But notice that the double quotes have turned into single quotes, and the single quotes have turned into double quotes. So all I've done is a simple transformation of this grammar. Now I take that example parse up here, this character string, I feed it to the inverted sum as the grammar, and it says, oh yes, what you originally compiled was x plus x minus x. So it's able to turn it around and go back. Because why? Because this grammar is one to one. Now, I don't have a good criterion for when this does and doesn't work, but anytime I care to make it work, it does work. So it's never bothered me that there are things that fall in the cracks. I cannot invert no white, for instance. No white just produces a big string of blanks because it doesn't know when to quit. And I told him, throw them away, fine. Unthrowing them away means throwing them at you. So no white doesn't do very well uh, if you try to invert it. You can do it. It's just not very interesting. So uh, now we want to start extending these. So those are the basic capabilities. They all came out of the box. I didn't really have to do anything to do that. So here now, I want to get rid of this business where I can only say single quote, one character, single quote. I like to put a bunch of things between the single quote. I like to put a bunch of things between the double quotes. Because why? Because almost always you want to do a lot of these things at a time. And to do that, I have to change no white a little bit. So this is no white 2, okay? And I've pretty printed it out so you can see it. And there's a special case here. Well, the G's instead of P's, blah, 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 blah. Throw away the blanks. Down to here, it's exactly what it was. Now it says if you see three quotes in a row, save them. Because quote, single quote special in the input strings. You can't embed one in there because it would think it was the end of the string. So I make a special case for three single quotes and another special case for three output quotes, which you can decipher at the bottom. Otherwise, it says, well, uh, if I see a single quote, go down and do phrase R. And phrase R says, well, if I see a single quote, that's good, get back out. That would be the empty string. Otherwise, emit a single quote, any character, emit another single quote, and then recurse on R. So what's happening here is I'm staying inside the character string, putting quotes around every character while it's going. So the consequence is that anything that was wrapped in double single quotes gets into a whole bunch of single quoted thing, single character things, and likewise for um, thing. And I'll demonstrate this for you. Uh, so here we are, and I've given myself now a big fat input symbol here. This is a grammar that accepts no input, and it's going to produce hello world as an output. So I run 
no white two on it, and it says the grammar is H E L, all wrapped in their own special output quotes, so that when I run this gem on it, it says, okay, answer equals hello world. So all I've done is taken multiple quotes, put them back into the original format the gem could understand, and it runs perfectly happy, happily with that. And as an exercise uh, to the reader, you can figure out what this one at the bottom ought to do, which is I've got two double quotes here with nothing between them at all. Okay. Well, I won't tell you. Uh, you can download this thing and try it if you like. Uh, all right, so there, it, incidentally, it works. It doesn't cause any trouble. So here we are now. Let's get rid of this uh, right associative stuff. Nobody wants right associative grammars. Let's make a left associative grammar like ordinary folks want. And there's a trick that you use in ML or languages like that to where they are recursive to unwind that to make it left recursive. And what you do is you take the first one up here and then you make plus T emit plus R, that recursives. So that gets you the sequence of R's. And this gives you now a left recursive uh, grammar, and that is to say a left associative plus, a left associative minus, a left associative star, and a left associative divide. And down here at the bottom, it's got parentheses. That one line makes it non-invertible. Otherwise, this thing would be invertible. And what does it do? It actually makes reverse Polish, parenthesis free notation of Lukasiewicz. That's the job. And in this particular case, uh, it makes postfix po Polish. That's the job. So I can go ahead and run this guy uh, for you. All this, of course, was run offline, so you don't get to see it. Uh, I could run them here. My laptop's got MATLAB up on it. So here we are. And I say, OK, take this expression, apply postfix to it, and here comes the Polish postfix boiling out. And if you want prefix the way Lucas say which originally defined it, well, you can make a different grammar, which I won't show you, called prefix, and that will give you prefix Polish. Now, this seems like a long way from the compilers that I was talking about in the entree to this thing. But if you think we're a long way from compilers, I simply change the output symbols uh, in a grammar called GX86 and run it, and it gives you the commands for the floating point stack of the G86. This code would run on a suitable Intel assembler. And all I did was change the Polish to putting out the instructions instead of uh, the actual uh, postfix Polish thing. So we're beginning to see that we actually could get towards making some kind of machine language with this kind of trick. And this wasn't really the important part. The important part here was making sure that we could do left associative expressions, which was what human beings want. OK, we can. That's taken care of. Well, I get really tired of making all these recursions that I don't want. So how about if we had Cleany star in the grammar? That would be sort of a nice thing. And then I wouldn't have to worry about making that rule for R uh, left recursive. I would simply say a t an expression is a T followed by zero or more R's. And what are the R's? Well, they were with them before. If you see a plus. Uh, followed by a T, emit a plus. All that does is move the plus across the T to make it into postfix. That's the effect. But now there's no recursion going on here at all. This thing is regular expression here. It's a regular expression here. As they say, it's the Cleany star. And so I would like to make my gadget gem turn my ugly, turn this pretty grammar into something that would be runnable in gem. OK. I take that as a challenge, and sure enough, we can do that. Uh, the trick here, uh, what the heck, oh, I, that's a bug in my publish. That, I left it per, ah, doesn't matter. You won't miss it. I'll fix it when I put it up on the web. So since Jem doesn't know about cleaning star, I have to do two things. One is for every rule R that was R starred, I have to give it a recursive rule. And it turns out what got botched on the top of my slide up here, for every place where R star shows up, I have to put a new symbol in for it, in this case, capital R. So I'm going to replace R star with capital R. And every place I've done that, I'm going to make up a new set of rules, which takes care of the recursion. And that gives me two separate grammars. One that I have back substituted for R star, I put an A and R in the place of it. Another grammar, which only has these rules here. 
Okay, so I've got two grammars coming out of this, and I can show you how that goes. It's sort of an ugly bunch of grammars, which you don't really care about. If you do, you can find out. And what it does is then turn my grammar here into a uh, grammar like this. This is the transformed grammar where the R now is showed up where the R star used to be. And at the very bottom of this is appended the two rules defining the R star. And that, to not make a mystery out of it, happens right here where I take the new grammar with the R star substituted and the new rules that I need and I concatenate them together. Now it happens to me the new grammar had the digits in the middle of it, so they showed up here. I couldn't suppress those for you, but there are only 10 of those, so you can probably put up with that. So that's the same grammar, but with the, I can use the star now, but it's going to turn it back into one that the machine can run. So I've made a step in, in improving my compiler writing language by allowing stars. So here I am now running that same expression, except I only have digits here. If I put the letters in, then they had showed up in this grammar, would have been off screen to a point. So this is going to be reverse Polish for just digits. And sure enough, with that star grammar processed into uh, a gem acceptable grammar, I can now get the same result. Now I'm allowed to use star in my grammars. I've made it so that if I've used star, I can transform it away and turn it back into the ordinary uh, kind of grammar that Jim can take. So Jim hasn't changed in all this. And I can do the same with plus. So it's easier in the case of plus just to go through and look for them. And every place you find a plus, put something that just says R, R star. Just change it into one and then zero or more. It's a much easier transformation to do. So I've done that also. And here I have a grammar using pluses. This grammar says, find a bunch of A's, one or more. Find a bunch of B's, one or more. What's well, it A? It says, if you find a 1, put out a 0, an O. And if you find a B, if you find a 2, put out a T. So if I feed it the string, that gets transformed. If I feed it the string 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, then it finds a 1, 1, 1, and then it finds two twos. Okay. So it's translated that. And now that means I'm free to use plus. Not only star, but also plus in my grammars. Now I'm making some progress here. Uh, there's lots more you could do. There's a lot of tail recursion going on here. You could flatten it. The search could be pre-computed. I don't have to search the whole grammar. I could know ahead of time where to look for the, for the rules, so it speeded it up. These predefined character classes, these big ASCII things, can just be pushed right into the interpreter, so they work like built-in functions instead of like macros. And that 100 factor of 100 speed up right there uh, when you do that. And you can put a lot of internal consistency checks. The embarrassing thing is the code I showed you before, you do anything wrong, it brings MATLAB down in rubble of bits. <laughs> no MATLAB. Anything wrong. Bad character in the grammar, bad character in the input, <laughs> down comes MATLAB. No protection at all. It's very touchy code. So I made a bulletproof one uh, here. Uh, I tell my students never to uh, do this kind of stuff, uh, you know, optimize it, but I did it anyway uh, because I liked it. And so now when I run it, uh, I give it the same input, and I give it the same grammar, but instead of saying compute ASCIIG dot thing, concatenating the grammar, I just say act like it was concatenated. So I have a bunch of flags here that I can concatenate to this thing, which tell it to pretend like those eight built-in classes, any subset of them, were actually concatenated to the grammar. But it never really concatenates them. It's got it built in, so it recognizes them immediately. So here we go. Uh, this is a new pretty printer, and I won't take you through the details of this, but this has the charm of not only takes out all the excess white space, but I mean, now it puts in all the white space you want, but it takes out all the excess. So I can pretty print now a perfectly garbage grammar, it squeezes out the white space, and then puts in just what you want. And it's, that's done by having B star here. B says, if you see a blank, throw it away. If you see character turn, throw it away. So first thing I do is throw away all the white space. And then I do R star, which is the number of, those are the rules that I want to do zero or more of. So this pretty printer now is much steadier. And I have to tell it, expect lowercase letters, uppercase letters, and uh, all ASCII to be passed by. Because L is used here, and A is used here. 
and I don't want to distinguish between upper and lower case in this case. So that's a fancier pretty printer. Uh, it's much more stable. Oh, come on. Much more stable. Okay. So uh, I also added to Jim some parameters like postfix. So I don't want to go to all the trouble and say use the postfix grammar. I just built it in. So you want to make postfix, you call Jim, you give it a string, you say use the postfix grammar. It figures out whether to get the star or the plus, all that stuff straightened out. And it just runs the right grammar so you get your postfix. Likewise for prefix, likewise for invert. So here you go for sum. You say, well, all right, here, take gem, feed it the sum grammar, invert it. Okay. Then feed that to the inverter, inverting it back. And then take that and pretty print it. Okay. So here is the old original sum grammar. Pretty. I inverted it, inverted it again, and then printed it out with the pretty printer. And since I had all these very convenient flags in here telling me what to do, it wasn't nearly as tedious. So these are mostly creature comforts. You have to understand I haven't done anything here except make the talk easier to give and make the thing easier to use. Okay, charging right along. Uh, here is a little bit of assembly language for an Intel x86. Actually, if you have it as a subroutine in x86, you've got to start with push EBP and move our EBP ESP that pushes the base pointer, moves the stack pointer into the base pointer, it makes a stack frame for what you're doing. And when I run it, I do a push A, which says, and save all the registers, damn it. I don't want to care about which ones have to be saved by the caller and the callee. I just save them all. So these three instructions are my prologue to an Intel uh, subroutine. When you come back out, you have to pop A to get them back out. Now you've restored the world that the outside world thinks you should have. Clear the EAX because you want to say, I succeeded. That's the return code of zero, standard return code from these things. Leave undoes the move RR, return undoes the push RR, well, actually returns the program counter, and that gets you back out. So the very simplest subroutine you can run in Intel is to concatenate these two guys together. So here's prologue and epilogue. I concatenate them together, these strings here. And I uh, run those against a grammar called GASM x86. I'm going to assemble this code, okay? Like any good assembler should, uh, it prints me out a bunch of ugly hexadecimal. But if you know the, la the language, there's the push EBP, there's the move, there's the leave, there's the return. So that is, in fact, an ASCII presentation of compiled, uh, of assembled, uh, Intel code. And uh, I don't want to just quit there. I have another guy called x86, exe x86. I dump that string off into it. It dumps it into the memory of my laptop and it runs it right now. It can't tell those bits aren't made by a real compiler. Uh, so it just runs them. It just says, okay, I'll run those. And in fact, it ran. And the way you know it ran is I didn't get a segv. Okay, it didn't blow up when I went off into the Intel hardware and came back out. So therefore, we are pretty sure this guy ran. And we're not quite done with this example. I can then invert the assembler. Okay, so here's the assembler inverted. I run it against the assembled output, though that hexadecimal string up there, and it gives me back the assembly language. So it's turned the assembler into a disassembler because the language is invertible. And in this particular case, there were no ambiguities it was one to one, and so it was able to turn itself back around. Charging right along. Here's a little calculator language. Uh, it has four variables, A, B, C, and D. And it, there's a little grammar for it. You don't need to know what it is. So I, in fact, uh, this string is called make 31 because it happens to be the answer is 31 for this. So if I run this string on a desk calculator, I would get 31. And I run that string. Okay, and I have a little calculator grammar that, calc that takes care of this language. So I run it against make 31, and since there's digits used in here, I have to append D to it. And so I print out the compiled version of that, and here we go. That's the compiled code for that little bit of uh, just calculator stuff. That's x86 assembler, hexadecimal string uh, that you can see starts with 55 as it always does. Then I say, okay, uh, good. 
uh, let's execute that guy. So I call exe x86 on that and executes it, and it gets 31. So that code got executed down there in the bowels of my machine, computed 31, and says, okay, the answer is 31. Yes, sir, here you go. But I'm not quite done yet. I say, okay, we'll invert that guy. I take my calculator. I put invert on it. This is a grammar you haven't seen yet, but I invert it. Okay, scan that guy in. And then when I run that compiled output, that is this stuff here, into the inverted calculator, it says, oh, yes, you uh, fed me this calculator program. So it's able to take the assembly language back apart, put it back together in the original source code. That's what decompilers do uh, for a living. Uh, you know, another example of that here is a function called uh, A to I. And so I have that built into it. And it compiled the code to convert 376 into an integer, ran it, and sure enough, it says the, the integer value, this thing here, is 376. Okay, so I've now begun the long stretch into connecting to the hardware. I can do anything here that I'm willing to compile into assembly language, and I'm not embarrassed about that. That's what compiler writers do for a living, right? They write programs that make assembly language. Now, I've just written a couple for you here. I've picked simple ones, but that doesn't mean that you have to stop uh, with simple ones. So anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, some things, when things go wrong, GEM just blows up. GEM2, the one that I've just been running, is much more stable against trouble. I've never managed to make it segv. Uh, but when it backs all the way out, you don't get much of a message. So here we are. I've got a, uh, a little toy grammar here, which says, well, uh, what is the, uh, I pretty print it, an R is an A or an R is a B. If it's an A, you better see an X emit a 1. If it's a B, you better see a Y emit a 2. So I expect either to feed it a 1 and see a 1, or feed it an X and see a 1, or feed it a Y and see a 2. So I feed it an X here, but I have the parameter T turned on, which is my trace flag. So now GM is going to tell you what it's doing. And there is the internals line by line every time it executed something doing this. And when it finally got done, you can see here, it managed to get an output one. So it really did do it. So when you want to get down deep into why things aren't working, which you will instantly if you ever try to run these things, then the trace facility tells you what the integers are saying step by step. Sometimes these are hundreds of thousands of lines long, so you have to find some way to handle the fact that they're very long line with searches and the like. Okay, so this is the debugging thing. If it goes badly, it gets up to where the stack gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then starts getting smaller and smaller. You look at the high point, because that's usually where the trouble was, or the farthest point of progress. You either look at the input uh, here, see how far that got, or you look at stack, see how it got that deep, and then you start debugging. And if that doesn't work, well, then you start putting print statements in. Um, okay, so what have we done here? This is the talk. Uh, now it's just a summary. Uh, I think I've shown you that you can start from something that's really teensy tiny, and you can invert them, you can directly execute them, you can extend them, and you can compile them. And I don't know what else you can do with them, okay? These are toys. These are for my students. I give them to them during the compiler course so they see all this stuff in a very concise uh, thing. And it's nice, it has a little bit of the properties of mathematics. There's some symmetry here. Right and left are symmetrical. In and out are symmetrical. So there's some value uh, in, in having the students actually look at this. If you want to see the whole thing, that's the URL for it. And this is my goodbye. That picture was taken by a student of mine while I was teaching compilers at Dartmouth a few years ago. And I rather liked it. It shows me in my natural element. So that's my signature. And that's the end of the talk. So, questions? Yes? In my thesis? No, no, no. Oh, his. Tell him. <laughs> his thesis and the published paper are online in my thing here, so you can see it. Let me, let me tell you what he did. He did something much cleverer than this, okay? His solution was reverse BNF Polish. I mean, he, he 
took the thing and turned it into not a sequential code like you see here, but a tree-shaped input. Okay? And it was much more concise. The problem is, you know, he never cared about efficiency. It ran like a pig. Okay? It was really, really slow. So I don't think we ever finished executing it, right? And I don't remember. The Burroughs V5000 was the machine behind this. This mean time between failure and our used machine was so <laughs> short that we couldn't run his thesis. Of course, I told him then he had to flunk. The deal was to demonstrate he had an extendable self-compiling compiler. He couldn't demonstrate it, so. <laughs> oh, well, he published it anyway. Uh, but that, that was just the very first piece of this. That is to say, it was the idea of an input grammar, an output grammar, and the fact that you could use it to make a more complicated one. And uh, that was, I mean, you ought to read his, his published paper in the USA Japan Computer Conference. Uh, that'll keep you busy for a while. What year? Hmm? What year? Third USA Japan Computer Conference, 1979, I think. So it's in, in my distribution. If you have trouble finding it, download this thing from the file exchange, and I have buried his paper way down in there, including the little story I told here at the beginning. Other questions? None from the world out there? Is anybody listening? How are you, Dennis? Dennis Allison is watching from his hospital bed in Montana, so he says, Jim. So why stop at two terminal gram, uh, vocabularies? I, I don't know. A whole, whole, whole set of intertranslatable languages uh, by having multiple, you know, not just VO, VI, but V1, V2, V3, V4. That is a great idea. Tell me when you get it done. Well, the point of two surely is spreadability, so you can go two directions. What would go in three directions? Yeah. Well, you can go from any. Oh, I see. You sort of walk any around language and any other in, in a collection. Oh, that's interesting. This is the reverberation of 1963, where Jim was writing uh, inverting uh, programs in Lisp, uh, which had that same property, which you're thinking of now. I think you remember that. Yeah. So, anyway, I don't know. I have no idea where this can go. This has been a toy for me. It's something to entertain my students, to keep them interested in teaching, uh, what, I, what I have to say. And I must admit that my philosophy of teaching is completely at odds with what they tell you how to do. I don't care what they learn as long as they really, really like it. And if they're excited about it, they will go off with something in their pocket. If you bore them to death, they may learn it, but it's not going to affect their lives. I try to affect their lives. This seems to do the job. Come on. Another thing that uh, you can compare it with is... Um, uh, combinatory logic, where you've got a very small alphabet. Now, the difference, I think, is that you've got this invertibility thing going for you that you don't normally find in combinatory logic. Otherwise, it's sort of very similar in that you've got this tiny alphabet and a huge amount of power that comes out of a tiny, this, this tiny vocabulary and this tiny set of rules. Well, let me make two other touch points back. Uh, if you look at Mealy machines, uh, which went out of favor in the 1970s. They were, for finite state machines, what this is for context-free grammars. They had both input and output characters in Mealy machines. He was using them for cryptography and that sort of thing. Never went very far, but, but they had the same thing. The other thing is, if you put curly braces where I have my double quotes, this is exactly yak. And the curly braces are the yak actions. Okay. I just don't like the curly braces because they don't nest very well if you're trying to quote them. So I use the Double quotes because they look better. But I ran this whole thing with curly braces once to see what it would look like. It was ugly. Okay. But this is exactly yak input syntax, where the actions in curly braces are the output symbols of mine, are just simply quoted. So the, the, this, the, much of this just isn't new at all. I mean, it's been around for a long time. Uh, most people, however, like yak, have built such a grand saloon around it, you can't see the elegance. Yes. So, and you're Yak not, is L A L R one. Yeah. Whereas you're not doing that here, are you? You're no, but I could, but I don't want to. Yeah. Well, another thing is in this course is a complete L R one. I've abandoned L A L R one, which is the normal academic thing. I use L R one directly because the tables don't matter anymore, and so my, all my table builders here are L R one, which is much simpler to to show to the students, and they are much more likely to take to them. Uh, I, I would sort of like to use the LR1 technology the way Jay Early did as a way to speed up this thing 
So it makes its decisions more validly. If it can look ahead one, then there are a lot of things it wouldn't have to go and backtrack out of because it already knows it's going to fail. So that could be done. Uh, but I, the, the fact of the matter is, audience, I'm not going to do this stuff. Okay? Why did I bring it here to Stanford? Somewhere in here, somewhere there's going to be something that likes this, and you'll do something with it. Okay? I'm done. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm 75 years old. I don't need to do any more of this stuff. But you do. Other questions? That's for you out there in Netland, too. Do the three vocabulary thing here. And in time. It's not just in space. Pardon? You're also talking forward in time. Meaning, oh, yes, because people are going to table this. <laughs> so I've been told. I get a question out of the future. <laughs> <laughs> it will come back to haunt me, I'm sure. Twenty years from now, somebody will call me. Oh! And they'll want to know something about this lecture, which I will surely have forgotten. So, guess we're done. Thank you all for coming. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.